I'm your host, Becky Davis, and you're watching GardenWise, Santa Barbara's most informative show about sustainable landscaping. Fall has officially arrived, and that means now is the best time to establish WaterWise plants. In our first segment, we'll visit the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden and take a look at their new demonstration garden to bring you some inspiration. This 1926 Craftsman home was originally used as the caretaker's cottage, where it was surrounded by a fence until 1990, when the home demonstration garden was first created. Over the years, the garden lost its luster, and in partnership with the city of Santa Barbara, the garden was redesigned with a new focus. We wanted to re-envision our home demonstration garden we, and make it more water-wise. We brought in Kim True of True Nature Designs to really help us rethink this. She really helped us integrate all the components of the water saving that we wanted to in the landscape and do it in a very aesthetic way. So we really started with, with figuring out a program, a design program, and then and figuring out where all of the puzzle pieces would lay on the site. We thought this would be the ideal place to demonstrate bioswales and rainwater harvesting in the ground you know using grading techniques so the first thing we really did was decide to do this nice dry creek bed which has a number of the downspouts from the house are discharging they're tied into the creek bed so instead of that water going off into a storm drain it's going into this creek bed where it can slow down and soak into the ground and then we also at the bottom point the lowest point of the garden have a rainwater garden which has a number of plants that specialize in um, helping uptake stormwater, clearing out pollutants, and then just really letting that water soak into the ground in that location. Betsy Collins, our director of horticulture, was also instrumental in picking all the great plants that we wanted to use in this garden. So this bed is really in just peak flower right now, and it shows some of the plants we've used quite a lot at this garden. Here we have our seaside daisy, which is uh, a plant that's native to the coastal bluffs here in the central coast of California and out on the islands. The plants that we use in this garden are all drought tolerant. Some are less drought tolerant than others, but uh, if you were to create a garden with just these plants, you would use less water. Natives just use net less water. And who can have a garden without our native live forever. So this is everybody's favorite plant. This is um, Dudleya bretonii from the northern coast of Baja, California. The Santa Barbara Botanic Garden is a wonderful place to explore the diversity of our native plant life and the home demonstration garden is a great place to learn how to incorporate those plants and more into your home landscaping. During the selection process, the garden staff took a lot of things into consideration. What are the natives that you can grow in your garden that are, one, beautiful, two, easy? They, they don't, they're not, they'll play well with the other plants that you have in your garden. You don't have to become a habitat gardener or um, not have your roses. The, these are plants that are adaptable to a typical garden. So these are plants that uh, you can come to the Botanic Garden and buy pretty reliably. We have been working for the last 70 years with the nursery industry to try and get natives um, into our general nursery stock. Get these good plants where people can buy them and use them. They grow them whether they know their natives or not. I really want to encourage people to come to the Botanic Garden when they want to think about changing out their own home landscape. Throughout the garden, we have great ideas, great plants, great things that you can also emulate on your own home landscape. The garden is full of great ideas, and the staff wanted to make sure everyone got the most out of their visit and could take some of this information home with them. We have created a water-wise natives for Santa Barbara. Describes the care and the uses of 85 of the best native plants for our gardens. So take a look for that. You can find that uh, on the city's website and here at the garden. There is always more to learn and more ways that we can improve our use of water in our home landscaping. The Santa Barbara Botanic Garden has many resources and great ways to learn. We have classes and instructions and, and uh, workshops that you can take in where we can help you design your own home landscape, learn about the native plants that are great for you, and make sure you know how to care for them so you have the same sort of wonderful result that we have here. Once you learn about the flora and, and how difficult it is for these plants to survive in our conditions, you really just get this appreciation for them. We just have a slightly different um, 
seasonality here and you can really experience that um, once you get into native plants and you can understand their seasons and and how our seasons work here and I think it connects you to California um, especially Southern California and, and the the challenges we have with water you know with having too much water and then not having enough and it's really a cyclical thing that happens over and over um, and it's good to learn about that and incorporate those sort of natural systems into your own home garden. So we want to make this simple here at the Botanic Garden to be able to do this on your own home landscape, to make your own landscape both native and water wise. To find a demonstration garden near you, visit waterwisesb.org slash demo gardens. Trees are a wonderful and valuable investment for our community. That's why it's important to keep them healthy even during drought. Up next, we learn how to water our trees effectively while also conserving water. Hi, I'm Kathy Perret with the City of Santa Barbara's Water Conservation Program. Today we're going to talk about trees, that most beautiful plant that is so valuable for our plants, our animals, our shade. It's a wonderful resource. We're going to talk today about how to efficiently water them, all the way from do-it-yourself projects to what a professional might do to assist you. Let's take a peek at all the parts that are necessary. There's a few parts that are necessary to put together an inline drip system. I'm going to come down, let's show you the most important. We'll start from where the water supply comes in. The water supply is going to come in, your hose is going to hook in, you're going to require a pressure regulator. It can look like this, it'll usually reduce it to 20, 25 or 30 psi. You're going to put a filter system on, this is going to remove any sediment that might be coming from the hose. There's a connector. It's just a thread that allows you to hook up drip tubing to it. Uh, it's inline drip. If you look down on the actual tubing itself, you can see some minor little holes and some thickness here. So every 12 inches on this tubing, I have a one gallon per hour emitter. I also have this tool out here. This is a soil probe. And the soil probe is going to allow me to actually take a soil sample these little holes are every two inches, so I can take a soil sample maybe 12 inches deep and find out at the deepest point, is the soil still moist down there? So we're gonna talk about uh, what's the proper type of tubings, where to place it, and then a little bit about how long to water for your individual trees. It really depends on the type of tree. Sometimes you may actually need to ask a professional ask an arborist to come by and give you a little bit more information about that tree. It's really important for us to try and provide the water and the nutrients that they need to continue to add value and beauty and shade and habitat in our environments and in our landscapes. We've got all our parts. Let's go mark the tree canopy and put this together. Well, we're over here at the water supply. The first thing I'm thinking about is doing the last little finishing connections to the tubing. I'm gonna put a T onto my drip tube so that I can make a circle around the tree. So we're gonna cut a hole, cut the pipe. Just using pruning shears works pretty well. Connect it up. Takes a little jiggling to kind of work these together and get them locked in. I'm gonna connect a T to this so that as I go around the tree off of one side, the tubing can come all the way back into here. So it'll get water going in it'll fill the tubing, it'll water all the way around. So we've got ourselves connected here. The next step is to figure out exactly where the drip line is. I like to mark it with flags so that when I'm laying my tubing out, I know that I'm in that prime zone where the plant's gonna absorb the water. So with this particular tree, it's easy to see that as the rain is gonna fall, it's gonna hit these outside branches and it's gonna fall directly down. So I would come out and come here and I put my little flag. You don't have to put the line exactly where your flags are because those absorptive roots where the moisture and the nutrients are most beneficial for the plant are within a couple of feet inside the drip line and a couple of feet outside the drip line. So the next step we're gonna do is we're gonna lay that pipe out, put some little tacks to hold it in place and then hook it up to the water. So now we're going to use these, they're called stakes, soil stakes. They're going to help hold the pipe down so it doesn't snake away on you. So the easy thing is to do now is we're going to add 
a T so we can connect up to our water supply. So we detach the extra piece of pipe. We have our T that's hooked up to what we're going to hook to the hose or to our valve. Take one side of this, give it a wiggle and a little bit of push. It's connected. We connect the other side. So we're going to hook this up to a hose. This is going to be our water supply today. We're already set up with our pressure regulator and our filter, which are really necessary to make sure that the drip or the inline or the soaker tubing uh, doesn't put too much water out over time. You can use your meter and if you check our website, there is a video as well as some flyers on how to read your meter just for this application. All right, we're hooked up. Let's turn it on. Today we're using a hose spigot for our water supply. You can hook this up to a valve in your irrigation system so that you can time it automatically if you want. Doesn't matter. So let's give this just a little bit of water. You don't want to crank it on. You just want to turn it on maybe an eighth to a quarter of a turn. Take a look at your drip zone. And what you should see is little drips coming out of each of those little emitter tubes, the ones that were every 12 to 18 inches apart. Well, we finished with our drip line connection. So now I'm gonna show you a super easy way, do it yourself, that you can use the water that you collect in your shower or in your dish pan to use that to water your tree deep and slowly. In order to make a slow trickle bucket, you need a bucket. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna drill four little holes so that when we put the water in the bucket and set it down in the mulch, mulch around it, the water's slowly gonna saturate as it's absorbed into the soil. So we've got our holes, our bucket's prepared. That's all there is to it in this part. We're gonna make a little space down here so we can get to the soil, put the mulch around the bucket. We'll place our bucket in contact with the earth underneath, put some mulch around it. We're keeping any evaporation from happening here and allowing it to really slowly soak in. Then we have our bucket from my shower water and we just add it perfect do-it-yourself deep soaker for your tree. For those of you who maybe have seen one of these devices used by an arborist or by city staff out with the trees, this is a deep watering soil probe. It's not something that most people regularly do, but if you have some trees that are distressed, if you see the city workers putting, uh, using this soil probe out on our street trees or in the parks, we're doing that for the health of the trees. Trees are such a wonderful investment. They give a place for the kids to play and the wildlife to be at. We really want to continue doing all we can to keep them healthy. For more information on how to water your trees effectively, visit waterwisesb.org. We'll be right back with more GardenWise. Thanks, guys. <laughs> well, that was very thoughtful of you. Well, you know me, Dad. I, um, plants don't need as much water in the fall and winter, so I decided to get up early and turn it down. So is that what you're wearing to Grandma's? Hmm. Take control of your controller. Turn it down. Welcome back. A big part of keeping your plants and trees healthy is knowing how to properly prune them. In our next segment, Oscar Carmona, instructor for the county's Green Gardener program, shows us how. Hello, Oscar Carmona. I'm the uh, owner of Healing Grounds Nursery, and I've got more than 30 years experience uh, working with plants and uh, in the Santa Barbara area. And I'm happy to say that I uh, use those talents and skills and experience in the Green Gardener course, which I've been teaching for 16 years. And uh, today we're gonna talk about pruning. Uh, pruning is an important topic because it has to do with uh, plant health. The first thing that you need to know, because the plant is a living thing, we need to understand its parts. Um, and so we have our wonderful subject here. This is a apricot tree that uh, I understand had a tremendous fruiting season this year. And so now we're looking at uh, the general structure. Once it's fruited, we can uh, look at the general structure and see where we might want to um, help the tree 
as it continues to grow. But let me back up for a second because I would like to talk a little bit about plant parts. One of the most important parts of plants which we don't see but is uh, nevertheless a vital part of plant uh, health is w what is below the ground and that's the root zone. So you have the roots as the, the basic fundamental part uh, in the ground and not only does it provide a support but it also provides the, the plant with nutrients and water which are absorbed through the roots. They are taken up through the roots into via the root, the trunk of the tree and the limbs, which are the support system, but they're also the highway for those nutrients and water to be taken up from the roots. And they go up through the, through the, um, into the canopy and out into the leaves. It's in the leaves, which with the help of the sun, the plant is able to make its food. It turns the nutrients and the water into a form of sugar which uh, is not only produced here, it's stored here, but then it's also taken back and stored into the root system. Beyond that, we have, of course, the fruit and the, the flower, and then the fruit, which emerges from the flower. And those are the important uh, components of the tree that you need to consider so that when you go to prune, you understand that you're affecting a living thing and everything you do has an effect on that. So we don't want to go in here and just cut willy-nilly or you know peel off every leaf because we're going to adversely affect the tree if we do that. So we need to have a, um, a more of a methodical and a thoughtful approach to pruning. So in order to prune properly, we, of course, we need the proper tools. Um, I recommend uh, hand tools that are properly maintained so that you can make good cuts and uh, that don't uh, peel or tear at the tree because of course it's a living thing and we wanna make sure that the tree is able to grow in a healthy way. Important again to mention that because this is a living thing and, and, and the leaves are where the food is made and stored, we don't want to peel off or prune off all the leaves. As a matter of fact, most trees um, require at least 80% of their foliage to be healthy. So you never want to take more than 20%, 25% of the foliage. You can do a fruit tree a little bit harder because they are very aggressive growers, but not much. And so recognizing the importance of the leaves will help you to remember to be diligent in your efforts to prune. If you've ever seen projects where people just fully remove the, the leaf system, you're going to see a very stressed out tree and that is undermining um, the health of that tree. So just be careful when you do that. You always want to start and I always tell people because it can be sometimes overwhelming when you look at the tree. Well, where do you start? Because there's no arrow that says start here. So you start with the most obvious problems. If you ever see any dead or dying parts of the tree, those could be the indicator of where you want to start because those are the obvious places. Now on a tree like this, it's fairly healthy. We don't need to do that. But what we might want to do in this case with a tree like this is to manage its size. Um, a lot of people think that with a deciduous tree, you need to just prune early on in the season before the fruit set when you start to see the, 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 the branches swell. That is a good time to prune. However, late summer after the fruit, has um, been picked, you can really see what is vital on the tree. So sometimes this is a better, actually a better time to prune because you can clearly see, you know, if there are branches that may not be um, growing as, um, as vigorously as others. And so maybe those are indicators of branches that you want to remove. Now we're going to talk a little bit about proper pruning cuts because now that you have a sense of the, of, uh, the living plant that you're dealing with and you have a a general goal in mind in terms of how you what you want to achieve with your pruning it's important to make the proper cuts you have good good equipment that are going to make clean cuts and now um, the point is that you need to uh, know exactly what where on the branch to cut and the thing is when you are pruning a tree you need to uh, take into consideration the fact that along the branch there are side um, branches that come off of it that can become leaders and so in this case, with a tree like this, we're just generally trying to scale it back. And we're not gonna do just a general tipping of all the, the leaves, but we're gonna go and be thoughtful in our approach. 
so that we um, leave the branch, as I say, and the tree in better shape than we, um, we found it. So if we follow this tree back, this limb back, um, we're going we're gonna to see here that there's a nice side shoot here that will take over and we can effectively scale it back in size by doing so. In order to allow it to heal, we have to make sure that we get a cut that's close, but not right on top of the um, collar here, which is where the union of the branch meets the larger branch. And you can see how I've already reduced this limb in size by doing that. So again, just to, to reiterate, you don't want to make wholesale tip cuts along the whole tree because that's going to just stimulate growth on the ends. But if you follow the, each branch and make a cut where it logically shows a potential for a leader branch, because this will now take the lead and follow up, we've effectively reduced the size and we've um, provided the tree with another uh, upper growing limb that will effectively make this tree a, a healthier uh, specimen in the long run. I hope you found this segment on pruning informative. If you'd like to learn more about pruning and other sustainable landscaping uh, techniques, come to the, the Green Gardener class. It's a free class. It's offered through uh, non-credit Santa Barbara City College uh, in the, through the Hort Department, and they're at the Wake Center, room 26. To learn more about the Green Gardener program, visit waterwisesb.org. Stay tuned, we'll be right back with more GardenWise. Wisely. It's simple. Visit waterwisesb.org. Let's save together. Welcome back. Do you want to transform your backyard into the space of your dreams? Up next, local landscape architect and author Billy Goodnick visits the home of two of his clients that want to do just that, but need a little help along the way. Billy, thank you so much for coming out here. Great today. to be here. And we love how the front yard turned out. Wonderful. We love it. And even Fred loves it. It's true. I mean, that's I, our guy. I was reluctant, but it, it looks great. I'm just concerned. What are we going to do with my grass back here, though? Well, that's why we're here today. So the photos you sent, the video, very helpful. I did a few sketches I can share with you later, but this is a time to kind of look around, see it in person. Give me the grand tour. So got this big slab here. It doesn't yeah. look like much goes on. Well, we inherited it with the house. We don't really know what to do with it. It's only the kids who ever used it when they were skateboarding, but they're gone now. Yeah. Just little circles. Yep. <laughs> well, some of the information you already sent me, uh, there was uh, the desire to have just kind of a social space. You've got dining up there, mm -hmm. and that I'm sure works fine. Uh, and then after dinner, break away, come down here. What about sitting around a fire pit? Yeah. Kind of a nice, it, it's already partly sheltered here. We've got some nice trees. Mm -hmm. Seems like uh, it could be a nice place to sit. So fire like pits it. don't have to be expensive. You can get store-bought ones, just portable. That's one way to go. Okay. Or you could uh, you know, bring in gas or something like that, build something build nice in. out yeah. here. And when we're planning this space, we just need to think about how many people are going to come down here, how much space our chair is going to take up, and make sure you can still get from the steps out to the rest of the yard. And the other thing I see here, we've got an existing plant palette, and rather than rip everything up, there's kind of a tropical feel to this. Mm -hmm. So when we get to the plantings, which is going to still be in a little while, we can talk about how the plant palette all sort of has the same conversation together. Okay, good. Good. What else we got? You were concerned. Well, look at my beautiful grass. I love my grass. I, I would like to keep my grass, or some of my grass. And some of that is for our wonderful puppy dog. Yes. So that makes sense. Uh, but what you have here, there's a lot of it. And yeah. Same thing, it's pushing up against the borders, plants have to be trimmed. So let's talk about the advantage, if we did reduce the grass, I'm not saying we have to, opportunities I see, and, and I, I did a little Ow. bit of sketching before I got here, just uh, a few basic ideas. We've got the dining area up here, mm -hmm. 
And it's a beautiful view down this way. So we would be looking across the uh, fire pit area and then our eye goes right out to here. And right now all you get are, you know, a few bushes and, and a lot of green, which could probably be upgraded a little bit if there was some sort of focal point. And that can be anything. It's just something special that stands out. Okay. Could be a big ceramic pot with seasonal flowers in it. Some sort of grouping. I mean, if, you, if you're into antiquing, whatever, just some object out here that, that when your eye looks down, it's like, I meant to do this. And one of the things on your list, I don't know if it was margaritas or mojitos, but a few citrus trees. If this lawn came in this way or whatever we put back in here and we had enough comfortable space here for a few dwarf citrus trees, Perfect. you get screening. Yeah. It acts sort of like shrubbery, but you also get a harvest from it. So side yard. Well, I, I love the idea of the citrus over there. Uh -huh. So why don't we continue that with some kind of veggie garden? You picked the perfect spot because we're on the west side of the house. We've got sun coming in from about mid morning and then it'll get sun all day. So this is, is really great. And if we're okay taking a little bit of grass leading up to here, you know, wrapping up to this point. This is great. And you would also mention something about a, a place for your uh, water barrel to get some rainwater okay. from here, which is just perfect for watering the veggies. When I was looking at the photos, this seems like kind of an ideal place. It's not visible from the house. You got rain gutters yeah. just above. Um, and as long as it's back in this area, it might be an ideal place to get some rainwater, convenient for moving it out to here. Perfect. So your last concern was uh, the spa area, uh -huh. just feeling kind of out in the middle everywhere? It's just not inviting. I mean, all the concrete and... It's very spartan. And it's exposed. Exposed, not intimate. Yeah, well, the fence isn't that high. You're a tall guy. So yeah, I can see there's connection to the windows. Mm -hmm. So what I see here is a lot of concrete, and I don't know if all of it is necessary. If you don't mind entering and exiting the hot tub, from a smaller radius around it, a lot of this concrete can go away. The other thing would be if this area came out, some of these plants could be allowed to, to grow up quite a bit taller and now you've got privacy from the windows. There's two reasons to, to surround this. One is actual visual privacy. Right. You don't want people looking in. But the other is just for a feeling of intimacy. You want to feel like you're kind of surrounded by stuff. Cocoon. So out in this area here between the uh, spa and the vegetable garden, you really don't need anything much higher than hip high, shoulder high, because when you're down here, your point of view is lower. You'll still feel like there's greenery around you. I know we've covered a lot of stuff here. Talked about... Uh, you know, the, the place to chillax, the hot tub area, the vegetable garden, all of that. Mm -hmm. How about I sort of summarize everything, put it in an email, you two hash out which way you want to go, what the priorities are. Once we have that settled, we know how much dirt is left, where all the plantings in, can go. Because for now, we're stuck with what we've got. Once the shapes change, we have more opportunities to pretty things up. Okay. Sounds okay? good. Okay, so you'll get your homework. Thank you, Billy. Thanks for having me out. Thanks very much. A lot of fun. Stay tuned for our next episode as Billy revisits his client's backyard to help them select the right plants for each space. Up next, we hear from Randy Baldwin about his favorite tree and why it's so special. What tree is that? What tree is that? Ah, what tree is that? What tree is that? Hi, I'm Randy Baldwin. I'm here to talk to you about dragon trees. We're here in Alameda Park where the uh, large dragon tree behind me is situated and it was the first tree to be measured and put on the California Big Tree Registry, a registry maintained by Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And uh, Dr. Matt Ritter, a uh, botanist there, put this tree on saying it was the largest of its kind in California. Well, others in the town of Santa Barbara knew otherwise, and so this started a committee working to look for those other dragons lurking in gardens and public spaces elsewhere. It is a tree that comes from Macronesia, which is the islands off of uh, north of Africa in the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, includes Canary Islands, which is where this particular one comes from, and also uh, the Azores, Cape Verde Island, and actually on uh, the mainland in Morocco. We noted that uh, Dr. Franceschi found this tree uh, in abundance here when he got here in 1895, which indicates uh, it does very well here. 
Um, trees of Dracaena Draco are scattered around the city of Santa Barbara. Um, you find them around the mission, you find them in El Paseo, you find them at the zoological gardens at Lotus Land, Casa del Herrero, uh, rather large specimens scattered about. Uh, they also grow quite well in Santa Monica, Orange County, and uh, quite a few of them in uh, San Diego, particularly on Coronado Island. Uh, this speaks to their adaptability to the climate of, of California, the Mediterranean climate, which they're very, uh, they come from a very similar climate. Uh, they're very drought tolerant for us, and they really are a great uh, structural element for the water-wise uh, garden, fitting well with succulents and other dry growing plants. So this tree has a, a fairly unique growth form, and uh, what, it, what this tree does have is it's called sympodial growth, and what that really means is that it actually branches and uh, at, at some point and either uh, divericates into two branches or may just branch instead of a single branch, which causes some of the lumpiness and look of, of the tree. Uh, and it does this uh, usually at the time of flowering. The flower and the resulting fruit that comes on it, which we can see on the tree behind me, results in killing the, the growth stem of the current branch, and then it branches at that point. And so things like yuccas do the same thing. And so what we're seeing on this tree is uh, many years of branching and flowering. Uh, and flowering is estimated to take place about once uh, on a branch, uh, once every three to seven years. So it's, it's, but there's always some branch on the plant that seems to be flowering and branching. And we can see on this tree, uh, right now it's in fruit, uh, but you can see the old spent flowers in some cases. And some of those you could trace back actually to places where it has branched. People might want to plant this plant in their garden. Uh, it's a great plant. It's a great, it uh, goes well with uh, succulents and other plants. Uh, it's relatively slow growing, so don't expect to either get a relatively large plant when you first purchase it, or to have it grow uh, leaps and bounds once you do plant it. We have about a 30 year old plant in front of our nursery. It's about 10 feet tall right now. So that gives you some idea. Generally, they're not found in retail nurseries, but uh, landscape contractors uh, can purchase these plants in sizes up to fairly mature. Maintenance on this tree is next to nil. Um, really requires uh, water uh, that you would get in the rainfall in the wintertime. It can grow faster, certainly with some additional irrigation. This one obviously here in, in uh, the park, Santa Barbara, is growing in a lawn, but separated from the lawn in a fairly dry uh, picnic area. But uh, it can go in, it was originally in the lawn, uh, and so this one probably grew faster because of that. So if you are interested in seeing more dragon trees, uh, there's certainly our website and you can just Google dragon trees in Santa Barbara and bring up a bunch of pictures of the trees. The forest at Lotus Land is one of my favorite places to go because you can walk under the trees and it's really a, a magical place there. Uh, Casa del Herrero has got a very large specimen. The trees mentioned at the uh, monastery, of course, Alameda Park here. Uh, El Paseo, the old El Paseo has nice trees. And I, again, I encourage people, if they see a big dragon tree and we don't have it listed somewhere, you can contact me about that, or certainly you can contact directly the Big Tree Registry at Cal Poly, and maybe you can find a bigger dragon lurking in your garden. For a list of other WaterWise trees for your garden, visit waterwisesb.org. Well, that does it for this episode. Remember, you are the agent of change, and together we can create beautiful, climate-appropriate gardens. There are lots of resources online to help. Visit waterwisesb.org for tips or to view past episodes. If you have any questions or comments about the show, you can give us a call at 564-5311. I'm your host, Becky Davis, and keep it waterwise, Santa Barbara.